positive fixes for VFR flight. Beards, tattoos and face piercings, what's acceptable for the airline employment scene and fuel testing in the wet season. Tips for detecting water. I'm going to answer all these and more coming right up. So strap in and let's get into it. Good everyone and welcome to episode 104 of the Flight Training Australia podcast. From Innisfail to Inaminka, Ingham to Inverall and everywhere in between, this is the podcast all about flight training and flying in Australia and beyond. G'day, I'm your host Trent Robinson and welcome to another great episode. Firstly, special update and big congratulations to my good mate Dan Bolton, aka that Mallard guy, on the huge success of his first children's book, Marty the Mallard and the Lost Tinny. It's been such a huge success with over 600 copies already sold and he also just recently had the prestigious honour of presenting a copy to the Prime Minister himself, Mr Anthony Albanese. So mate, well done. Fantastic achievement to you and your dad uh, with the awesome illustrations there. And to everyone who has purchased a book, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it and the kids will love it. And if you're holding on to it as a Christmas gift, uh, look, they're going to love it too. So if you haven't picked one up yet or have no idea what I'm talking about, check out the link in the description. Get your own copy before Christmas. Have a look on Dan's Facebook page. It's on mine too. And all the uh, books now are available through the Amazon website. So get your copy on its way to your mailbox today. A lot of you have also been asking about the Mallard and uh, what it's like to fly in that. And yeah, look, I think I've said it's just absolutely fantastic. I will... Uh, do something a bit more detailed on the Mallard soon. But uh, unfortunately, due to the being off season for the pearling season, there hasn't been as many flights at the moment. And I am uh, a bit of an extra crew member, as it says. So I've got to let the guys uh, that are paid to do the job have all the fun. But I am flying it this week. So I will uh, definitely get a few photos and videos up. Although I'm not focusing too much on that because I am still very new to the whole thing and still have a heap to learn but uh yeah keep an eye out on instagram and facebook this week there will definitely be uh, a few photos and things going on there all right so questions uh there's been some great questions that came in uh the other day again usually once a month on instagram story i'll uh, ask for questions on anything uh, that you'd like me to sort of cover off on the the podcast and i've got a couple of great questions and the first one is from stuart and Stuart wrote to you, uh, can I try and have a quick question regarding something in the AIP regarding VFR navigation requirements? So on route 1.1, paragraph 4.2.1, I love someone who does all the research, states that you must navigate with visual reference to ground or water or using any method in paragraph 4.1.1, which is essentially the VFR, oh, sorry, the IFR methods. I always was led to believe that IFR methods could be used as a supplement to dead reckoning. Could you please provide me with a bit of clarification on this one if you have some spare time? Well, here I am in my spare time <laughs> making an answer to your question, Stuart. Thank you very much, mate. Great question and uh appreciate that you've already done a little bit of reading into it and you're pretty much spot on. So for everyone's going, what the hell is on route 1.1 paragraph 4.2, let's have a look at it, shall we? So in the good book, the AIP, we can have a look at on route ENR 1.1 and then flick through until we find paragraph 4.2 and that is flight under the VFR. So let's see what it says. The following apply in respect of flight under the VFR. A, the pilot in command must navigate the aircraft by visual reference to ground or water or by using any of the methods specified in paragraph 4.1.1, which, as Stuart said, this is the IFR stuff. I'll leave that for a second. Let's just stick to VFR. So item B, when navigating by visual reference to ground or water, the pilot in command must positively fix the aircraft's position by visual reference to features shown on topographical charts at intervals not exceeding 30 minutes. When flying over the sea, visual reference features may include rocks and reefs and fixed man-made objects which are marked on suitable charts and identifiable from the air. So th this is quite a big thing because I've had plenty of people who have tried to convince me that they just need to be able to see the ocean or see the ground 
every 30 minutes. And as you can see there, it is very clearly saying that you need to be able to visually uh, position fix. You need to be able to identify the features on the ground, track them across the chart and go, yep, this is precisely where I am. All right, so VFR is 30 minutes. Now, if we have a look further on, this starts talking about uh, VFR on top as well, which really is something you need to be careful of, and I'm not going to go into that too much now. Uh, but part E is quite interesting that it goes into navigating by reference to radio navigation aids or GNSS. The pilot command must maintain, sorry, obtain positive radio fixes at the intervals mentioned in paragraph 4.1 and 4.5. All right, so if we move up to paragraph 4.1, this is the flight under the IFR section. So if you're going to do anything other than visual fixes every 30 minutes, there are options as a VFR pilot to utilise the skills as used under IFR. An aircraft operating under the IFR must be navigated by an approved area navigation system that meets the requirements or navigation system or navigation routes using nav aids, getting positive fixes, and the maximum time interval between these positive fixes must not exceed two hours or by visual reference. All right, so essentially what it's saying is you could use VORs, NDBs, and GPS, of course, using cross Positional fixes, you can have intersections from VORs or NDBs, DME arcs, all that sort of thing to get a positive fix, or you can use GPS. So, Stuart, the answer to your question is absolutely you can do that, but what it comes down to there is competency. You need to know how to use those nav aids, their serviceability, their range, obviously checking the uh, NOTAMs and things like that to make sure that they are indeed in service at the time you intend to use them and use them within the applicable uh, navigation tolerances. So if you don't know anything about the PBN tolerances, uh, how your GPS functions in terminal mode, on route mode, all that sort of thing, how the CDI scale changes, that's really what it's all getting at to make sure that you're going to use it properly because you'll be nominating those nav aids uh, that you're going to be using on your flight plan Remember, you're not indicating on your flight plan what's in your aeroplane. You're indicating what is in your aeroplane that you can use. So you don't circle things that you're not qualified to utilize. And that way, you uh, shouldn't get lost. <laughs> All right. All right, Stuart. So, yeah, look, really great question. Thank you for that one, mate. And hopefully, that uh, resolves your issue and answers everything you wanted to know. All right, next one is from Hayden, and he uh, mentioned that he's got a question regarding getting his first job in the aviation industry. My question is, what are your thoughts and the industry's view on pilots with tattoos? Something that has me questioning whether to look into getting some removal procedures done. Is this something that could hinder my application process or cause some hiccups along the way? And it's a really good question, and I have been asked this uh, several times before. So I'm going to go one step further here and sort of cover all the, the things, which is beards, tattoos, and uh, face piercings. I'm not going to worry about body piercings because hopefully they're not going to be um, visible and seen. All right. And the answer very much depends on who you're looking to apply to and work for, as the standards do vary. So I put the call out to um, some of family and friends all uh, in the respective airlines across Australia here from uh, Qantas Mainline uh, and then other aircraft, the Qantas Group, like uh, Network and the like, Jet, Jetstar, Virgin, uh, Rex and Bonza. And this is pretty much what I found out. So the main airlines like Qantas and Virgin, uh, so Qantas dress standards typically just requiring uh Tattoos to be covered by uniform. There's plenty of pilots that do have them, but they need to be covered by uniform items. So if you're in the winter months, you're wearing a jacket, you can wear a long sleeve shirt, long sleeve pants. Uh, sorry, long sleeve shirt and long pants. So that's going to cover up most. It's really just like hands, uh, neck and face tattoos are going to be a problem. And, yeah, you probably need to really consider that. All right, other Qantas group uh, ones really tattoos need to be covered. Jetstar, 
tattoos need to be covered and uh, the same for virgin. Bonza, not an issue. Tattoos are okay. All right, so there's uh, they're a bit more liberal there. Um, as far as beards go, the, the general thing, and I have covered this in an episode before, that obviously if you can have one neat and trimmed, but there is the uh, ongoing theory or evidence that a beard can hinder the seal of a oxygen mask, uh, not so much to stop oxygen getting into your lungs when you're breathing, but to stop smoke and toxic fumes from entering the mask as well. So they generally prefer that you have a clean, trimmed, shaved face and no beards and stuff. Some airlines do allow uh, beards with restrictions. So Big Ned Kelly, probably not going to work, but uh, something uh, a little bit more than a five o'clock shadow could possibly be okay. As far as facial body piercings and that sort of stuff goes, uh, typically need to be removed or covered up again i have seen cabin crew with a little band-aid over the top or something like that um personally i don't know i, th- I think that is more off-putting um and untidy than than one or two earrings but that's what the deal is and uh, generally speaking for everyone as well when you are at work or in uniform heading back to hotels and that sort of stuff there's no drinking alcohol in uniform chewing gum smoking and vaping in public view all that sort of thing so ultimately it is 2023 we're starting to get a little bit more liberal these sort of things and uh options uh people think being a bit more flexible we're accepting many jobs in many industries uh, to have tattoos and piercings and that sort of stuff. It's just becoming more accepted. Uh, But you really need to do a little bit of research and look into the company that you're looking to apply to uh, to double check that there's not going to be any uh, embarrassment or hassles down the track when you accept the job and everything else turn up to work and then they're like, "Uh, yeah, this isn't going to work. All right. So thanks, Hayden, for that one, mate, and uh, hopefully that all works out. So the final one is talking about fuel drains and fuel samples. So I posted a photo on Instagram the other day which was of a fuel drain bottle that was full of water except for just a little bit of fuel at the top. And uh, that was from last wet season. Well, it was actually this year, earlier in the year. Uh, Out of a 172, it just had some really heavy rain overnight and when we went out to the aircraft the next day, Uh, I took the fuel drain on my wing and almost, because the whole thing filled up with water, um, almost missed it. And I was looking at it going, this just doesn't look right. And I realised it was all clear and hang on a minute, this is all water. So it is definitely something you need to be careful of, as especially in the top end, um, out in the desert, uh, all across through WA, Central Australia and into Queensland there and down south, but... uh, the fuel tanks and things that can be exposed, especially if they're not hangered, the fuel seals and uh, all that can deteriorate and water can get in very, very easily, especially when you've got the the size of water drops that we get up here. It's not hard at all for uh, water to get in and, yeah, contaminate the fuel. So it's definitely something you really need to watch. So those that have been flying already, I'm sure at some point you've maybe seen a few bubbles of water in your fuel sample. It's no big deal. Uh, take the sample, get some water, chuck it out, do another sample. If there's no water, then you've got it all and you're good to go. However, um, as you would have seen my post the other day, and the photo's still there on Instagram or Facebook, but just just a little bit of a centimetre or so of fuel on top. But that was the, about the third or fourth fuel drain at that point. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of water, and we did about another four or so at least. Uh, before we got all that water out and uh, deemed it all okay. So if you do come to water, it's simple a matter of just keep draining until you get it all out. You might want to give the wings a little bit of a shake just to make sure that all the fuel has settled to the lowest point of the tank. And depending on the aircraft you're flying, I'm sure if you've flown a new 172, uh, by the time you finish doing a fuel drain on those, you just about have to refuel again because I've got, uh, f- was it five fuel drains on each wing and three underneath? And that all came apart, um, came about because of Cessna being sued after several aircraft had some serious levels of water contamination 
and the aircraft had a, a fuel contamination incident with water. So they thought, all right, buggy you guys, we'll put a fuel drain on every point of the tank that water could settle. And uh, that's why there's so many on there now. But older aircraft, it's typically just the one or two on the wing and maybe one or two underneath, gasculated drain, that sort of thing. So make sure you do those drains Check it all properly, but you can't just rely on the colour. It was the clear colour that uh, made me look twice and uh, get it. But the dye, especially in fuel drums, if you're refueling from drums, can uh, absorb into the water as well. The water can take on the colour, so it's not a perfect uh, stopgap measure. Some say check the smell as well, uh, but again, water can take on the smell of the avgas and fuel, so that's not reliable either. All right, but once you've done your, your wing wobble and allow it to settle for a few minutes, um, do your fuel drain, check that, but have a look at the actual meniscus in the fuel drain sample itself. What's a meniscus, I hear you say? You know, the bubbly part on top. So if you fill a glass of water, you can usually fill the glass right up to the top and then it bubbles up over the top or a bit of a convex bubble. That's the water meniscus. Avgas is concave. It actually... Uh, bubbles downwards or collapses down into the fuel sample. So have a look at that next time and you'll you'll notice that it's actually p- behaves differently. The other thing you can do is, of course, use water detecting paste, and this used to be the uh, CASA requirement, but no one ever really did it. Uh, it wasn't widely available, cost money, all those sort of things, and most places uh, get fuel from fuel trucks and and places where uh, Viva and BP and all that are available and they do their own water sampling. So I guess CASA sort of <laughs> gave up and uh, lacks that one a little bit. But it is there. You can uh, use it as like a green paste, stir it in the water, and if there's water present, it'll turn purple. So uh, definitely something that you could utilise, but... When you've got that much water, it's quite obvious, so you should be able to see it. One thing, though, is if your fuel drain bottle is a little bit dirty, it can grab onto the water. So even though you might um, pour the fuel out, make sure you kind of really sort of chuck it out and and flick it out to make sure you get that water out because what can happen is the water can stick to the fuel drain. Then you just put more fuel on top and you go, oh, there's still water there and you pour it out and you just keep putting fuel onto the same water sample, thinking that you're getting more water. The other thing you could do is everyone, I've had students do this before, is go drain, 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 and go, oh, look, I found some water. And you go, oh, which tank did that come from? And they don't know because they've just done 10 fuel drains and not actually looked at it. So every time you take a sample, make sure you check it. It's okay to put one sample on top of another, but check it first before you move on to the next. And again, if you get water, Make sure that you drain that off. Um, One other tip is you can pour the fuel sample over a dry tyre and water will bead on the tyre if it's present as well, if you're having trouble seeing it. So that's another little trick. Thanks, Troy, for that one. All right, guys, that is it for uh, today. I hope you got some good tips there and good information. I will be back again next week. Back into it. Uh, the weather is definitely building up here. Still a little bit cloudy. Uh, we've been getting a couple of little showers, but uh, I'll start getting some uh, better lightning and uh, cloud thunderstorm formation uh, video and photos soon. There's some, been some great build ups showing up. I'm just going to get the camera out and capture some of it. All right. Uh, everyone else that's looking for jobs, don't give up. Uh, the general feeling at the moment is that uh, January is pretty much when everyone's going to be hiring again so if you're thinking about heading up to the top end uh, get your 206 or 210 check flights booked in remember that can consist of Lazo training uh, Dharma familiarization and uh, the like it's a chance to get familiar with the area and also practice for your check ride Uh, I will talk about more next episode but uh if you want to do that in January, I've just had a two-week cancellation, uh, which has uh, been pushed on to another time. So that has opened up uh, some bookings. So if there is uh, something you want to do in January, February, ready for the next sort of hiring intake up here, get in touch. Let me know. Send me an email, info at trentrobinsonaviation.com.au. Uh, all the other details are in the episode description. You know where to find me online. All right, guys. 
blue skies. And as always, stay flying and remember the golden rule. Aviate, navigate, communicate. Cheers, everyone.